Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for the gift of your spirit. And I pray, Father, right now for all those that would be under the sound of my voice, that you would bless our hearing, that, Lord, your people would receive revelation, knowledge, wisdom, spiritual understanding. Lord, we ask you for wisdom and for words of faith and conviction of truth. Father, I ask that you would speak through me by your spirit the words that you would have spoken, that your spirit would speak by me, that your word would be on my tongue, that you, Father, would make my tongue the pen of a ready writer that I might write on the hearts and minds of these, your people, your anointed word removing their burdens and destroying their yokes forever. As we boldly declare that, Satan is defeated. We are redeemed and Jesus is Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. And you may be seated, hallelujah. We read before the prayer in Acts chapter 16 and, 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 and the reason I wanted you to see these verses in Acts 16 is because here's a woman that the Bible says was possessed of an unclean spirit. But in that state that she was in, in that place of bondage, she was taken advantage of and she was used. And she was used, verse 16 says, by her masters and much gain came to them by using her. Now, this particular day, according to verses 17 and 18, she would come across Paul and these men of God notice that she was bound by an unclean spirit and in the name of Jesus, they called that spirit out and she was made free that very hour. But notice what happened with her freedom in verse 19. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers, and we'll later find out that they were beaten and thrown into prison because they liberated somebody that had been used as a pawn. Now, I want you to know right now that if the enemy has used you in any way to advance his kingdom, the last thing he wants is for you to be made free. But the hope that we have here in the word of God is that no matter what my past may have looked like, no matter what kingdom my life may have advanced in my past, God is able to, to liberate me in the authority of the name of Jesus and take a life that was once used to advance darkness and use it to advance the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to that in here this morning? Glory to God. Think about your own life before your salvation and the things that you may have done or the, the, the influence you may have used over others that now, since you've been saved, you're not influencing people in an ungodly way. You're trying to use your seats of influence in a godly way. So we're talking about kings and pawns, and I really want to bring this home by, by something that is, that is uh, dealt with in the book of Romans. So if you would, turn over one book to the book of Romans, and I want to go to the sixth chapter, Romans chapter number six. So Revelation chapter one, verse six, teaches that God has made us to be kings, kings and priests in the earth, that God wants to use us as subordinate kings to advance his will in the earth. That is the premier topic of the word of God. The kingdom of God is mentioned 122 times in the New Testament. It is the message of the New Testament. Jesus came that we might enter into his kingdom and be used as ambassadors of his kingdom in this earth, advancing heaven's will in the earth. That's God's plan for us. But what I want you to recognize is that just as God wants to use us to advance his kingdom, the enemy, Satan, wants to use pawns to advance his kingdom. And one of the definitions of the word pawn is a person that can be used to advance or further the purposes of another. Now let's go to Romans chapter six and when you get there, say amen. So Romans six is a chapter 
that if you've, if you've accepted Christ, if you've been saved, you should be able to see yourself in Romans chapter six. All, all, we, we show up here in Romans six because Romans six is talking about this new life in Christ. It, it, it even uh, addresses our baptism in verses three, four, and five, where we've come to know Jesus, we've been saved by his grace. Verses three, four, and five talk about our baptism. And in context, verses three, four, and five are saying that we were buried in the likeness of Jesus' death and raised to walk in newness of life, that that is the portrait that baptism represents, that I've been buried in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life. That's what we say, as a matter of fact, when we baptize here at Word of God. It is a, it is a physical picture of a, what should be a spiritual reality. You think about all the things that we've done in our life before we came to Christ. You think about how you used your hands maybe and your hands were yielded to do that which was wrong. Maybe your mouth spoke curses over people instead of blessing and you yielded your body to that which was wrong and that which was evil. But now that you're born again, you wanna yield your life and your mouth and, and all of your assets and all that God has put in your life. You wanna use it for the advancement of his kingdom. So there's this contrast of what once was and what is now and it's depicted in baptism, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Let me show what I'm talking about by looking at some of these verses here. Notice he says in verse number uh, 11, he says, likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Now, verses 13 and 16, I really want you to pay attention to. Not that I want you to ignore the others, but, but watch what verses 13 and 16 are saying because I think it will help us understand the difference between a king and a pawn. He says in verse 13, neither yield ye yourselves members, neither yield, yield ye your members, your, your, your hands, your feet, your mouth, your mind, your body, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members are your bodies, are your hands, your feet, your mouth as instruments of righteousness unto God. See, watch what he says in verse 16. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So he's saying here in verse 16 that, that your life, what you do in your physical life is all about who you're gonna yield to. That if I yield myself to sin and use my body, you know, for sin and the advancement of darkness, then I'm serving evil. But if I yield my body to what is good and what is right toward God, then I become an ambassador or representative of God or his kingdom, and I show myself that I serve the Lord. See, he's saying here, you can't say you serve the Lord, but then you, you yield your body to that which is evil and then say with your mouth, you serve the Lord. He, he's talking about this contrast between what was and what should be now, what we were like before we accepted Christ and what we should be now. And, and, and that, that, that's kicked off in the first few verses there when he talks about our being baptized and buried in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life. Listen, if you've not been scripturally baptized, you need to be scripturally baptized. Scriptural baptism happens after you recognize what Jesus did for you and you believe that he died on the cross for your sins. You believe that he paid your sin debt. You confess him as Lord of your life. You acknowledge the sin in your life. You ask forgiveness. You believe and confess that God raised Jesus from the dead and upon that belief now the next step is to follow the Lord in baptism just as the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts chapter 8 when he asked Philip what does hinder me to be baptized and Philip said do you believe and he said I believe with my heart that Jesus is the son of God and Philip went down into the water and he was baptized 
He didn't sprinkle him with water because nobody gets buried by sprinkling dirt on their head. The word baptize in the Greek means to immerse or submerge. So he took him down into the water. That's the way John the Baptist baptized. That was the way Jesus baptized. It is a picture of death. I'm going down in death, raised to walk in newness of life. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Can you say that out loud? Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. So maybe when you were baptized, you know, which was a picture of your salvation, you were buried in the likeness of his death. What you used to do in your body, now dead. How you used to use your hands to steal, now dead. How you used to use your feet to get yourself into trouble, now dead. How you used to use your mouth to say stuff that was not right and tell lies and curse folk, that's now dead. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. And now the hands that once took, now give. Now the mouth that spoke lies now tells the truth. Now the mouth that once cursed men now blesses men. Do you see the contrast? Surely all of us have something in our life that we should have left in the water of baptism. We should have left under the blood once we accepted Christ. But don't think just because you are saved that you can't still be used as a pawn. And don't think that the enemy won't use folk that even name Jesus in your life as a pawn to do what the enemy came to do, and that's to kill, steal, and destroy. The woman that was being used as a pawn in Acts chapter 16 was actually saying the right thing, but she was being used by the enemy. Paul recognized that and made her free, and Paul got attacked because the woman that had just been made free by the preaching of the gospel could no longer be used by the enemy as a pawn. What I want you to think about, and we're gonna go look at some other verses real quick. But as we read these next few verses, I want you to think about it and bring yourself into the, into the light of his word and say, okay, am I really being used in my life to advance the kingdom of God or am I just being used as a pawn of the world to advance the world's culture, to advance the, 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 the enemy's agenda? Who am I really serving? Now go with me, if you would, to the Gospel of John, and I want to start in the 10th chapter. So let me reiterate something we just read. It's Romans 16, uh, Romans 6, 16. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death our obedience unto righteousness. He's saying, who are you yielding to? Who are you letting use you? Nobody really likes being used. Look at you, look at you, look around the room. Even first-time visitors that are here today that's been a little bit skeptical of me, all of a sudden said, I like that guy. <laughs> Nobody likes being used. Now, before you get, you know, too happy about that, that's actually not a good statement. Because it, it, we, we should want to be used. Now, wait a minute. There's two people that just said amen when I said nobody wants to be used. Now you're saying yes, 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 pastor. <laughs> You can't have it both ways. But I'm gonna be real with you. None of us really like being used. But what I want you to think about for a minute is it's not a matter of just being used, but who is it that's using you? Because I, I don't think we really as believers say, I don't want to be used. I remember when I first got saved and I got in church and man, I was all in. I'm just radical about whatever I do. If I'm a fan, I'm all in. If I go to a game, I'm shouting and hugging strangers. I mean, I'm just a fanatic about everything. I married Chrissy. I've been passionate about her ever since. I, I'm always flirting with her and messing with her and teasing her and after. I'm in hot pursuit of her all the time. I'm just a radical, passionate guy. When I preach, I can't be quiet. I just have to get all in. And so that, that's just the way I am by nature, right? And so when I first got saved, I was all in like, hey, y'all got a rug. You need to vacuum. You got something you need to do. I was just all in. And I had all these folk that knew me and they said, man, that church is using you. Think about that for a minute. 
And, and every once in a while when I would get tired and I'd get asked to do more than what I already offered to do, and I'm like, why had nobody else getting asked to do some of this stuff? And that seed was planted. And I said, man, maybe they are just using me. <laughs> now, raise your hand if you've ever thought about that. Man, I'm just being used. Sure you have, right? But wait a minute. It's not that I shouldn't blanket the use of the word used. Because if I could sing right now, I'd break out in the song we just sung about 20 minutes ago. But I don't need to try to sing right now. I'm already dealing with this throat issue, and I don't need to try to break out. I know y'all looking at me like, do it, Pat. No, I'm not doing it. You're just using me. <laughs> but if I could get Pastor Jeremiah up here with a mic, I would have him break it out because you sung it just a little bit ago when you said, I, I, I give myself away. I give myself away, help me, so you can. No, you didn't sing that in church. Did you not just sing with your hands in the air? <laughs> Some of y'all had tears and the ugly cry. You know the ugly cry. The ugly cry when you don't nobody see it. Ugly cry. All my cries are ugly. And you say, you say, you say, Lord, I give my, I wish I could sing right now. My voice won't let me. I give myself away. I give my, so you can use me. And you just, oh, Jesus, I want you to. And then, and, then, and, then, and then the enemy comes and says, they're just using you. I need to be used. If I'm not being used, I have no purpose. If I'm not being used, I don't solve problems. If I'm not being used, then I have no value. If I'm not being used, I have no value. Therefore, I'm not influential. I need to be used. God used me to bless somebody. God used me to start a business that would employ a thousand people. Hey, God used me. But what we really don't want is somebody using us with a bad agenda, with the wrong agenda. Lord, use me for the kingdom. Use me so folk will know Jesus. Use me so your love and your truth is advanced. But I don't want to be used just as a pawn in the hand of the enemy to advance that which is evil in the earth. That's why in volume one of this series, we talked about the discernment between what is good and what is evil. Because if you don't have the discernment between what is of God and what is not of God, then you don't know when you're being used or being used as a pawn because you can't even discern what is true and what is not true, what is godly, what is not godly, what is uh, 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 good and what is evil. So you have to have that discernment so you'll know whose kingdom it is that you're advancing. Now, watch this in John 10. Is everybody there? And we'll look at it in verse number 10. So is anybody here that wants the Lord to use them? Well, let him use you. See, we're going to walk, we're going to drive out of here today. And we're going to have a level of peace getting off the, the uh, parking lot because of the volunteers that coordinate the, volu the, the parking lot. They say, you stop, you go. And they do it with a smile every Sunday, even in the heat, even in the cold, even in the rain. And, and, and if they were not there, it'd be a mess trying to get off this parking lot. Now, you might drive by and say, I'd never let nobody use me like that. But you benefit from that person that's letting God use them. You see that? Let the Lord use you. Would you tell your neighbor that? Let the Lord use you. Because I believe in life, somebody's always using me. But I want to be used to advance the kingdom of God. I want to be used to make a difference that brings life to people. Watch this in John 10, verse number 10. If you're there, say amen. amen. The thief, that's the enemy. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. It's so important that you recognize who is up to what. Because if John is robbing the bank, but you keep blaming Fred, then you chase Fred and John keeps robbing. Too many people are blaming God for what Satan is doing. We need to recognize who's doing what. So Jesus here in John 10, 10 is making it clear that the thief, he came but for to steal 
and to kill and to destroy. Now Jesus is going to make it clear why he came. He said, I am come that they might have what, church? Life and what else? And that they might have it more abundantly. So the Lord said, I want you to have eternal life. I want you to live. And not only do I want you to have eternal life, between now and eternity, I want you to have abundant life. I want you to live the abundant life, a fruitful, abundant life, mentally, physically, spiritually. I want you to live the abundant life. That's what I came for. The enemy, steal, kill, and destroy. Notice he's, he's setting it up so that we know both the enemy's agenda and Jesus's agenda. Now, with that in mind, go back to John 8. Go back two chapters to John 8. There's no doubt in my mind, church, that the enemy has used individuals to come into our lives to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, okay, let's just be real. Is anybody here today that the enemy used somebody to steal from you? My hands up. I've been, I've been taken from. It'll really make you mad at the pawn, won't it? That's why God wrote the Ten Commandments. That's why he put in there, thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not kill. Why? So I wouldn't kill the one to steal. <laughs> Some of y'all will get that in about an hour, all right? Let me just move right along. What I'm wanting to do in the next few verses here that we're going to look at in the Word of God is get you to see past the individual and what they tried to do or may have done and see that they were just a pawn that was being used by the enemy to steal, kill, and destroy. You, you may be here today and you, somebody tried to kill you. I'm just glad you're here. <laughs> Obviously, it didn't work. Amen. You're a living testimony. Glory to God. But, but, but somebody was out to kill you, but you're here today. You should have been killed, but you're alive. So the enemy may have planned that, but it didn't work. And, and maybe the enemy came through somebody and they were out to destroy you, destroy your reputation, destroy your marriage. Is there anybody here that the enemy has used folk that spread lies on you and try to hurt you? And maybe they wanted your spouse and so they, 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 they undermine your marriage or maybe they wanted your job, so they lied on you. Surely there's something Somebody here that the enemy's tried to destroy in one way or the other. I'm not asking you to jump up and shout about it. I'm trying to get you to see that that's a reality. But most of the time, what we face in life from the person that steals, kills, and destroys is not Satan himself, but someone that he is using as a pawn to do those things. Is that making sense? All right, so with that in mind, watch this in John 8, verse number 44. Pay attention to what Jesus is going to say in verse 44 because there's going to be a key in verse 44 that we'll need when we turn to 1 John chapter 3 next, all right? So watch this in John 8, verse 44. You're there, say amen. All right. He says, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. Now, he's not talking about biological father. All right, this is a spiritual issue. You of your father the devil, the lust of your father you will do. Watch this. He was a murderer from the beginning. Read that part out loud. He was a murderer from the beginning. Now, if, you're, if you know your Bible well, then you know in Genesis chapter four, Cain committed the first murder. And he murdered his own brother. We're going to look at that here in a minute in 1 John chapter 3. So just kind of put a, put a, put a, uh, you know, a pin in that, holding on to that, because Jesus said Satan's actually a liar. Not only is he a liar, he is a murderer. And not only is he a murderer, he abides not in the truth. That's important. And I know that to be true because in Genesis 2, 17, God tells Adam Hey, there's this tree called the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of it, you will surely die. Verse 18, he gives Adam woman, Eve, 
Genesis chapter three, Satan comes to Eve and says, hey Eve, can you eat of all the trees in the garden? She says, no, not all. There's one we can't eat of. And this is the way she words it. She said, God said, if I eat of it, don't eat of it lest you die. Lest you die. That's not what God said. Now, granted, she learned it from her husband, Adam, but that's, God didn't say don't eat of this tree lest you die. He said, if you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. Not might be, hypothetically, it could happen less. No, surely. As soon as Eve said to the serpent, we can't eat of this tree lest we die, Satan said back to her, you can read it for yourself in Genesis 3, he said back to her, you will not surely die. He used the same word she omitted. In other words, he knew the truth and helped her in her interpretation to buy a lie. He knew she omitted the word surely and said, that's right, you won't surely die. He's a liar. Not only is he a liar, he knows the truth but won't abide in the truth. So he uses the truth against us by by perverting or twisting the truth. And so Jesus is telling us from the beginning, Satan will not abide in the truth. From the beginning, Satan is a liar. From the beginning, Satan is a murderer. He ends it with this. He says, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. Now, let's go to 1 John, that's toward the end of your Bible, and I wanna show you something in the third chapter, but hold on to what we just read, all right? So go with me to 1 John chapter number three. So, when you have been lied to, when you have been lied to, whoever it was that told you the lie was a pawn. Now, I'm going to explain all this because I don't want you thinking, oh, thank you, pastor. You just made me free. I used to lie all the time, but that really wasn't me. That was the devil. He made me do it. No, 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 no. That's the same kind of mess Adam and Eve tried to use when God brought Adam and Eve and the serpent in front of him and said, Adam, what have you done? And what did Adam do? Who did he point his finger at? He said, the woman. He said, that woman made me do it, Lord. And so when he brought the woman forward, he said, Eve, what is this thou hast done? What did the woman say? She said, the devil. But God brought Adam, Eve, and the serpent in front of him, and all three were judged. So God made man and woman accountable for who and what they yielded to, which means no no matter what it is we've done in our lives, no matter how we were enticed or tempted, God still holds me accountable for the choices I've made despite what influences may have been in my life. I'm still accountable for my sin. All right, that got three, that's right, and a hand clap. All right, I'm just making sure everybody got it. Because I don't want you leaving here today saying, well, you know, that was the enemy. That was the enemy. I, I, I wouldn't have done that. The enemy took over. No, you yielded yourself to that and allowed him to use you as a pawn. But the good news about what I'm trying to share here today is, is that no matter how the enemy may have used you in your past or how he may have used somebody else in your past, Because God has never met a man he didn't love, he's never met a man he couldn't save, and the same person that once yielded to darkness to do you damage can be converted and saved, and the same mouth that cursed you can be a mouth that will bless you. You've got to recognize that just as you can be saved, so can your enemies. What would happen if we just saw it for what it is? This individual's in a place where they're just being used as a pawn. I'm gonna start being, I'm gonna start praying for their freedom. Glory to God. All right, watch this in 1 John chapter three. Because what can happen is, is let's say you got a lying, cheating, conniving person getting ready to come to church and then somebody warns us, hey, pastor, I found out there's a lying, cheating, manipulating, uh, thieving person coming to church Sunday. He looks like this and this and this and I need you to know they're coming so, so, so we can get them and stop them at the door. 
No, we need them here. We need to get them under the word. Because if it's not but the grace of God, I'm telling lies today. But by the grace of God, he called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, by the grace of God, I may not be what I want to be, but I am not what I used to be. What, what I used to use my influence to advance one thing, but now God's using my life to advance another. I may have been a pawn, but now I'm a king. And I've seen people that were once being used as pawns now be used as kings to advance the kingdom of God. Watch this in 1 John chapter number three. Because you might be thinking, right, well, Pastor, do I have to pray for that person that was trying to destroy me? Because you're saying it was Satan, but I, I know where she's at. I can show you, I can show you her on her Facebook page. <laughs> and you all up on your phone, like, here she is, right? Here. This is the devil. She tried to take my husband, she tried to take my job. Amen. Let me leave all that alone. I just sense that we are able to pick up on pawns. I just sense that every one of us really don't need any help finding those pawns that the enemy's been using in our lives that tried to keep us down and tried to keep us broke and tried to keep us depressed and tried to keep us in the street and tried to keep us in the club and didn't want us being free because misery loved company. Well, if you can see it in somebody else's life, we got to start seeing it in our own. Amen. Because this whole separating Sunday is our holy time, and this is when I'm going to let the Lord use me two hours on a Sunday. That's got to go. We've got to get in this position where, Lord, I want you to use me seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Use me on my job. Use me at the baseball field. Use me in everything that I do. We've got to let, stop letting the enemy separate Sunday from every other day in our life. It is something how we can come to church and be so critical of anything and everything but not use that same standard in our own life. Go to church and leave saying, I just don't like that style of worship. Even though the words either, either are about God or they're to God and they glorify God, oh, I just can't go there. I just can't get into that worship. And then get in your car and listen to some secular music that has nothing to do with Jesus and nothing to do with God. How can we be critical when we go to quote unquote church and not have that same criticism about how we manage our house, how we, how, what we listen to when we drive down the road? I, I, I say one word and you think, oh, I, I don't know if he should have used that word. But folk you should, shouldn't use the word hell in church. He, he uses hell too much. And then you go home and put in a, a rated R movie that's filled with every word. Pop. You fill your house with language that if one of those words were spoken here, you'd leave the church. Okay, back to the book. First John chapter three, watch this. Verse 10, I'm almost done. In this, the children of God are manifest, are made known, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, Watch this, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. Now, we already read in John 5, 44, or John 8, 44, where Jesus said Satan was a murderer from the beginning. But the first man ever murdered was Abel, and he was murdered by Cain. But Jesus said Satan is a murderer from the beginning because he got Cain to do his work for him. You ought to be tired of letting the devil use you. No, uh -uh, no more. You done used me all these years? No. And don't go neutral on me. I'm just, I'm just hurt right now, and I, I just don't want to be used by anybody. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired of being used. If my child calls, I won't even answer because I've been used. Don't go there. That, that was somebody right there. That little comic strip right there was for somebody. Somebody just got freedom right there. It's like, oh, okay, Lord, I'll get that right. <laughs> Verse 11, 
He, he said, the message has been the same from the beginning, but so, according to John 8, 44, has Satan's plan been from the beginning. And so he was a murderer from the beginning, according to John 8, 44, but watch what 1 John 3, 12 says, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. Watch the unseen war. Don't forget, this whole series is about the unseen war. Let me show you the unseen war in the latter part of this verse. And wherefore slew he him? Why was there conflict? Why did Cain murder Abel? Why the conflict? Why the war? Why? Here's the answer. Because his own works were evil and his brother's what? Righteous. Unseen war. Unseen conflict. But what was it really about? Good and evil. What was it really about? This man was being used by God to advance truth. And Satan entered into Cain and murdered him because of that position. Church, marvel not that the world hates you. Jesus said it hated me before it hated you. You have to recognize that if you're going to be used as to advance God's kingdom, then the enemy is not going to set back and let you just advance the good will of God. No, he will use pawns to try and stop you. We have to be sensitive to that. So if you want to ride this politically correct life and say, well, I just don't want to, you know, rub anybody the wrong way, then you're going to let the enemy neutralize you through intimidation. And that's exactly what he wants to do is to intimidate us to stay silent, to intimidate us to keep our Jesus inside our church with our steeple. No, I'm going to let the Lord use me and take what I got when we assembled and I'm going to go in this world and I'm going to share the love of Jesus and I'm going to share the truth of God and I'm going to let my life be used to advance his kingdom. Let me pray for you this afternoon. Glory to God. Father, we thank you today for your word. And Lord, if there be any one of us here today, God, that's been used as a pawn, that's been used to advance the enemy's agenda, but, 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 but is ready now to be used for your kingdom. God, may this be the day, may this be the day that old things are passed away and all things have become brand new. Lord, if there be one person here today that, that the enemy has used pawns to steal, to kill, or attempt to kill and destroy, may this be the day of discernment. King or pawn? Think about that, and I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge the times in my life that I yielded my flesh to temptation, to sin, to the agenda of the world, and I ask forgiveness. I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for my sins. I believe his blood washes me. I believe that you raised him from the dead that I might have eternal life and that by the power of your resurrection I can walk in newness of life. So I ask that you fill me with your spirit and give me conviction of truth and use my life, use my life as a subordinate king to advance your kingdom, your will, just as it is in heaven, on earth. And give me the discernment to recognize the pawns that the enemy would try to use in my life. And I ask in Jesus' name that I never again be used as a pawn, but rather a king, that my life would bring you glory and advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.